what's it like to work in a castle? Who is Sappho and why is her bus so important? And is interactivity the future or the death of museums? Today on episode number 11, we talk to the brilliant Laura Littlefair about museum curation, the process involved in getting a hold of, marking and looking after artifacts, and her recommendations for getting involved in the field. You'll be surprised with how much you'll learn. All that and more to come, I hope you enjoy the episode. So I'm going to let you just take the stage at the start just to tell us a little bit about what curating is and what kind of skills it takes to do something like that. Yeah, such a, you start with the big questions. Um, yeah, I'm starting yeah. off big. Essentially what we do, we look after objects and collections and basically, you know, everything that we try our best, I guess, to preserve everything for people to enjoy, to learn with, to, I guess, experience, obviously experience is a bit more difficult at the moment, um, mm -hmm. but it's something that... I guess like the the kind of care of kind of museum objects or um, works of art or archaeological objects. I mean, the collections I work with are very varied. And so I think a lot of people assume it's just kind of like putting up pretty pictures of art on the wall and stuff. But it's there's a lot more that goes into it than that. And actually, we barely ever do anything like that. Like normally that's sort of like the really fun stuff you occasionally get to do. There's a lot more background right. stuff that, that, that goes into it before you get to that. But effectively, it's the kind of entire kind of care of objects so we're you know talking from like um kind of conservation cleaning and occasionally fixing them if they are broken um to kind of making sure they're in the right environment storing them correctly um when they're on display making sure that they there aren't any stresses on the object making sure that they're not being damaged by pests by light people and basically trying to tell the stories about these objects and kind of make them come to life effectively the interesting thing there is that it's obviously a role which sounds like you need three people to fill because what you've said there is <laughs> yeah. you, you're dealing with like conservation and cleaning and you're also dealing with the presentation of the objects yes that's, yeah that's that's a whole field within and of yeah, itself absolutely i mean as part of my ma i did two modules alongside conservators so i do have some conservation training but i'm by no means a trained conservator but it does mean that i have an understanding of this i say the science behind it but actually i do know some of the you know the reasons why we're looking after them in the way that we are and you know i actually i mean it's very sad but as part of my, i remember when i was doing my exam um you had to kind of know the Latin names of pests. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I can't recite them to you now at all. But the point is, I can recognise pests that are actually going to be damaging to a collection. Um, and that's mm -hmm. something that not everybody in museums knows. It's something that it's predominantly yeah. conservators. So to have those extra skills alongside is actually, it's really helpful because it means that you can actually be part of the conversation when you're trying to do conservation work on a, on a book, on an object, on a painting, whatever it may be. And you actually understand the processes that are going on rather than just kind of giving it over to conservators and kind of, you know, taking a step back, I think, from that process. So, but that's not something that a lot of museum, like normal, I mean, part of this, I think, comes to the fact that where I work, I'm kind of, I kind of do a bit of everything because they're just aren't the people to to do it so i kind of have to be a jack of all trades because we don't have a specialist conservator that they you know they work for the entire university they're not specific to our museum so so what is actually your line of work then because we know that you'll do a curation yeah but where do you do it and what kind of things are you as you put in your words are you caring for yeah so basically so i work at durham castle museum and the Museum of Archaeology, um, both of which are kind of owned by Durham University and they're kind of under the, the kind of umbrella of like the university museums um, alongside the Oriental Museum um, and then like the archives at Palace Green Library. So we all have different kind of specialisms and our collections are very varied. So obviously you know, the Museum of Archaeology, it's full of archaeological objects kind of dating from, you know, really early prehistory all the way to kind of more you know modern 20th century discoveries but yeah basically i knew nothing about archaeology when i started this so i've had to learn on the job um i came from more of a history of art history decorative arts background so the collections at the castle are far more my kind of thing so we're talking there's lots of oil paintings lots of kind of 17th 18th century furniture we have mm. some beautiful 17th century flemish tapestries they're really lovely wow. yeah they're kind of a an unusual thing to have. Um, we have plenty of arm, arms and armour. So we do have some like Baker rifles um, and like some objects from like the Napoleonic Wars and the Civil Wars all the way up to then because the castle became home of University College in 1836. It's meant that we now have a lot of social history collections of 
basically the lives of the staff and the students who live there. And that's kind of the stuff that we're mm-hmm. actively collecting. So objects that kind of tell the story of the castle as a part of the university. So that's kind of its more recent history. But as a result, we have a lot of different collections and a lot of kind of they all have different requirements for kind of looking after them. So so that's definitely been I mean, it's been a challenge just to kind of I get my I guess get my head around the fact that archaeology is very different to castle and the kind of things that I'm dealing with are often rusty, are often dirty, compared mm-hmm. to things that are, you know, in gilt gold frames and stuff. So they're very yeah. different collections, but actually equally rewarding, I guess, in terms of how I've guess I've learned to kind of care for them. So So when it comes to things like the archaeology because you said you know you got this Flemish tapestry you got things from the Napoleon Wars with the Baker rifles how do all these come together in a way that doesn't seem random because this isn't done right what you're going to end up with is a very costly warehouse uh, (laughs) dumped full of full of crap in in different places so how how do you manage to make that look like something which makes sense uh, in people's minds absolutely yeah so a couple of years ago I was involved with the so there's an area in the castle called the Tunstall Gallery and basically it was built in the sort of 16th 17th century and it's a place where effectively it was kind of for promenading and for displaying your kind of most prized possessions and stuff so we've kind of turned this space that's our kind of main museum space basically we we've got the various we've got like about six cases in there and so each of them have kind of a theme to them so we have like the defense of the castle so that's kind of looking at its kind of place within different wars within the country and it's also its place in the kind of first and second world war because students were at the college during both of them obviously a lot of students went off to fight in the first world war and so we do have records of students who sadly died on the western front but we have some of their kind of possessions from when they were at university um and they are on display and um, we also have some stuff from the second world war when the college was used for an R- as an raf kind of like training base so they were teaching like short courses before students would go off to train with the university's air squadron wow. so that's all isn't kind of- it incredible though that you get this kind of history because i went to lancaster university and that's only dates back to the 1960s yes so yes. there's only you know a relevant amount of history that we have Exactly, as Lancaster yeah. University. Yeah. But to think that the students who went to that university who were part of the, you know, the Air Force and, and did yeah, fight in yeah. these world wars, it, it just seems like it, it really brings that connection back Absolutely, from yeah. you to these people. Yeah, it's it's really mad. And so that's that's kind of one way that we've, I guess, framed some of the collection. And then kind of carrying on with that kind of like student interaction, we have a case about all the kind of more recent social history. So we've got programs from the kind of annual June ball. And um, we've got photographs of like domestic staff who at one point actually used to live in the castle wow and yeah there's people who are like who in the not too distant past who like grew up in the castle and then worked there um that's amazing it's mad isn't it yeah it's it's really cool and they're very fascinating people to talk to because obviously they they know you know the castle is their entire life and so they have kind of lived through so many different you know changes um both you know when they started but also kind of when they by the time they retired kind of what the the kind of community was like was like then so yeah that's a really interesting case because it's got a lot it's a lot more kind of tangible links to recent Mm. history and I think because students now can kind of look at this and relate to it you know we have objects in there that were as recent as I think 2017 in the in the cases so objects that have been recent acquisitions as a result of like I said like the June ball programs from like choir sort of recitals I think we have like a hip flask from June ball oh you know like photographs from sporting teams from like the early yeah. nine, the early kind of 1900s stuff like that so we've got a whole range of things but then we have stuff like the arms and the armor we have a beautiful silver Victorian candelabra they all kind of stand independently within the collection but they've kind of yeah. got their own cases to kind of explain why they're in the castle because some people have donated objects some of them belong to the bishops not many did because the bishops often when they say for context I realize that I'm of jumping ahead in all of this that no so it's fine the castle was built um it began to be built in 1072 um wow. yeah under it's William amazing. the Conqueror. it's mad isn't it it's nearly it's nearly a thousand years old which you know so much has happened in that time and i, I think we forget sometimes just how long the castle has stood and actually how much yeah. of history it's actually we have, seen. i mean we have sliced bread now you i know? mean it's yeah it's amazing electricity um <laughs> it's one of those things where 
the bishop, basically the position of a prince bishop was created and it was kind of considered like a king in the north. So you'd often, you know, you have the king kind of based in London um, and then you would have the prince bishop whose residence was in Durham Castle. They also had a secondary residence at Auckland Castle. So some things between the two, which is in Bishop Auckland, about 20 minutes away. So um, they kind of had the had options, um, but they predominantly reside in Durham Castle. And so over the years, we've seen kind of scores of different bishops come and go. Some have done a lot of mm-hmm. developments to the castle some have done very little but as they kind of it, because it wasn't you know passed down through like the family line it meant that objects kind of came into the collection and went out again as the bishops moved in and moved out so not that many things from the bishops actually survive we have a few things um right. like the throne of um bishop van milder he was the last of the prince bishops before that kind of position was dissolved kind of in line he gave the castle over to the university so when it was when the sort of orders kind of came through he officially sort of signed it over in 1836 but it was in 1832 that it was kind of he made the decision that this is going to happen but obviously at that point there were only kind of there weren't that many universities in the kind of the uk so it Mm -hmm. took a while for those kind of things to sort themselves out yeah basically we don't have a lot of bishops things we have things of the bishops like paintings of them but we have actually a lot more kind of the social history of the the castle since it's been a college since 1836 so i guess what's really nice about it is that it's i think people assume that we're kind of full of airs and graces and that all we have are you know all these oil paintings and tapas which yes we, we do have those things but we also have such a rich collection of objects that are that kind of share the stories of both staff and students who've yes. lived and worked there. And I think that's what's really important is that there's so much more to it than just, I guess, the grandeur that people associate with a castle. So It's true. It's a very good point that because when I think of a castle, all I do think is that grandeur element. Exactly, and yeah. That does feel like there's quite a separate between me, who probably comes from a, a line of pure lowly peasants, <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, these grand figures. And, you know, I think a lot of people perhaps who might not consider themselves to be particularly interested in, in yeah. castles or, or that type of history, they might not have an interest in going there, but knowing that there's that connection to people that they can actually relate to exactly, yeah. must be so important to them. Yeah, and it's one of those where you often find the, the kind of things that people genuinely have an interest in when they're looking round and the kind of objects that people find some sort of connection with are the ones that kind of relate to to people whether they be photographs um, yeah. an object that be that belong to somebody or something that kind of provides i guess that kind of tangible link between kind of where they place themselves kind of in the in the present to also you know people in the past who they're like oh you know like i feel like i can maybe understand a little bit of what their life was like because something that belonged to them or a photograph of them is here rather than something that happened five six hundred years ago i think it yes it kind of bridges that gap a lot better. And it's something that I think is really important with a collection like ours that we, you know, we are actively collecting objects that kind of tell these stories of the students and the staff that work here because, you know, it's as much the castle's history as the Prince Bishops. And it's, you know, we're a very unusual museum because, you know, we students live in the castle so i mean obviously lockdown was a very strange time for the castle but it never properly closed down to the point where we always had um, porters on the gate and even though there were no students living there you know there was always some sort of activity even if it was very slight so it's it never properly closed down to the point where it was you know there's nobody there um Mm -hmm. but it is it's an unusual place to have a museum because most people i guess associate museums with you know very kind of largely kind of clinical places where you know you can't eat you can't drink People don't, people don't live there, whereas, you know, people have formal dinners in the Great Hall. They have... Sounds the most... This, I'm not going to lie, this sounds like the most Harry Potter I mean, slash Game I mean, of Thrones thing. I mean, it's funny you should mention that, because... So the, so the stories I've been told, um, when they were scoping out filming for Harry Potter, they came to Durham Castle. No way! Yeah, and they wanted to film there. And basically, obviously, because it's a because it's a, you know, college of the university, they were like, this isn't something that we can agree to, because... Obviously, it would mean that it would be a lot of logistical nightmares for, you know, the fact that it's a living, working building. And so yes. they didn't agree to it. That's and incredible. That yeah. could have been so close and to being so, Durham. So actually, a lot of the things that are in the Harry Potter Great Hall have been kind of taken directly from some of the things that we have wow. in ours. But then they did do some filming at Durham Cathedral, which is obviously like 
you know, stones throw away from the castle. So, so they did do some filming in Durham, just not in the castle. Right. Very interesting stuff. So you mentioned about like you guys are actively looking for things, right? And, yes, and yeah. when it comes to curation, I would guess that a big part of it that you do have to find new things. You know, you want to make sure yes, that it keeps yeah. relevant and interesting. How does that process work? And has that changed over the years? Is there, was there a different way of doing it a couple yeah, hundred years ago? Kind I mean, of. especially with this bishop. Do you just go around and ask him? Yeah, so basically now, so if somebody wants to donate an object to us, it has to be something that we are, in our kind of collecting plan, it has to be something that we're actively collecting. Right. So they can't just turn up with, I mean, the example that my boss always gives, because she used to work at a museum that was just a social history collection, and she was like, we had scores of singer sewing machines, and she's like, Mm. we couldn't, like, we couldn't use all of them, but people just kept giving us singer sewing machines, and we got to the point. Wow. Where, yeah. So that is, I mean, disposal in a museum is a whole, and rationalisation is a whole kind of separate thing to kind of talk about, and that's something mm. that it's not really talked about quite so actively. Like it's it's a necessary part of a museum, but it's something that people are very scared to do because effectively it's getting rid of objects. Um, mm. Which I mean, that's not what you've asked me. I won't go into it, but the point is, it's something that kind of can happen if you collect too much of the same thing but essentially if someone says oh i really want to donate my um my gown from when i was a student here and my uh, undergraduate hood from when i graduated we have forms which basically they have to kind of fill in to kind of agree they always People are often like, oh, can I not just give you the object? It's like, it, unfortunately, it doesn't quite work like that because they have to formally give ownership to us so that we... Oh, interesting. We are the official... Because basically, if they just give it to us, we have no record of where it's come from. We don't know that, you know, they may think, oh, I'm just loaning the object to you. I want it back eventually. We basically have to establish that sort yeah, of legal was, uh, ownership. There was an interesting story, and I might have to change this to Pentagon, whether I'm right <laughs> or not, but... I'm sure there was a story regarding O.J. Simpson. He tried to rob his own official museum yeah, that had yeah. sections about things that, that had about him. And he tried to go in uh, and take his stuff back, which, you know, he did it in, in a way which I wouldn't consider to be the most appropriate. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I mean, that's the whole thing. You know, you do sometimes come across people who they say, oh, I've given this over to the museum. And then in, say, 10 years time, they're like, so can I have that thing back now? And that's one of the things you want to, you know, yes. you have to establish the fact that even if they're like, oh, you know, like, I'm not bothered, just take it. That isn't something that you can do. You have to formally and legally sign over objects to the kind of museum's care. And basically that, you know, we will, to the best of our ability, look after this object for you and it's going to become part of our collection. So we have to kind of, there's various forms to sign. So then basically once it then becomes part of our collection, um, we then have to give it an accession number. So that's basically our way of, basically gets tagged effectively. Um, And that's a way that we we can then catalogue that object within our collection. So, for example, if, say, we had a new object that came in tomorrow, it would then become part of, you know, our numbering system, for example, would be part of the 2020 collection because that's the year we're in. Um, and then we would basically get the next number in the sequence. So depending on what collection it belongs to, so whether the ones at Durham Castle, um, at the Museum of Archaeology, the Oriental Museum, the art collections, they all have a different kind of prefix at the beginning. And then basically it would then be 2020 let's say 0.83 you know the 83rd object you've had so we basically we'd mark that on the object we basically we have various ways to do that depending on like the the kind of fabric of the object so if it's a textile we sew a label into it i say we i sew a label into it um (laughs) or we kind of use um it's a reversible system so basically we use um a solution with it's it all sounds very sciencey now but basically it's uh, it's kind of a plastic called paraloid b72 and basically you um, mix it with with acetone and basically it becomes kind of like a i guess almost like a very thin plastic film so it's a liquid I and mean, you basically you paste it onto an object let that dry and then you use like um we use black and white ink depending on the color of the object and then you usually kind of like you know use um i guess calligraphy sort of pen or like a you know basically a pen with a nib you mm-hmm. dip it in the ink you write the number on it and then you basically use some of the solution on the top of it to kind of seal it in so basically this is a reversible thing so that this can be removed with acetone should you wow. need to remove it so it's it's never we're never permanently marking the object we're always doing something that is reversible and we're never kind of actively damaging the object so that's one of the right. most important things to remember so people have to make sure if they go into the museum they should really leave their acetone at home absolutely yes don't take your <laughs> acetone to the museum i mean you shouldn't be in a position where 
that's going to affect you know they should be behind glass but yes. yeah exactly you know i've seen sort of over the years lots of different i mean it's kind of become a fun a fun thing that i mean i don't think my fiance enjoys this but whenever we do go on holiday i mean i always make sure museums are you know top of the list to visit museums and art galleries yes. and similar kind of institutions but sometimes we'll go to ones where they clearly don't have the same sort of standards as we kind of have maybe in the UK or they're clearly not part of the Museums Association, which is the like registered body that in order mm. to be an accredited museum in the UK, you have to be part of the museums. Basically, the Museum Association have to give you accreditation. So unless you meet the standards, you can't be accredited as a museum. Interesting. So basically that kind of sets the standard of museums in the UK. So there's definitely ones I've been to both here and abroad where like I go around and I'm like, this wouldn't stand. I can't believe, you know, like... This wouldn't I, go oh, in. Seriously, I, I'm really <laughs> like bad. Your checklist. And he goes round and he's like, Laura, please, can you... Like, he's like, do we have to do this on holiday? I'm like, yes. I'm like, and then I'm taking pictures. I love pictures. this because, because museums <laughs> take long enough to go through anyway if you're with someone who's very uh, interested in them. So yeah, never mind when you're checking the Oh, yeah, no, because he's a physicist. So, like, I mean, I've, I've had to school him on, like, what, you know, museums are like. And it's <laughs> like one of my favourite things to do, actually, is to take him to um, modern art galleries because yes. they're usually quite, you know, on the whole, I'm not a massive fan of contemporary art. Like, there's some artists I really love, but there's a lot of stuff that's obviously, it's, it can be quite avant-garde and very out there mm. and abstract. And, you know, there's very little context to the work. And there's, I remember we went to an exhibition and it's really, oh, it, it, they basically had, it was titled Fat on a Chair. And it Brilliant. literally was, like, looking like lard, like, on, oh, a, on a wooden lovely. chair. It really wasn't great. But it's kind of become... A running joke now so whenever we go places like unless it's like fat on a chair i don't want to go laurie like that was <laughs> that was the pinnacle of um I, <laughs> just look, because he's like this look, is you just go stupid. right up to the manager and you're like look um <laughs> I, I don't want to be the one who said this but like yeah i mean i've it, seen fat on a chair yeah seriously it, it's kind of something that art is very subjective and i mean there's mm. you know we can have a whole discussion on that separately but everybody has a sort of opinion about and it's something that you you know even if you work in museums you don't you know you don't like everything you don't you know you, you are allowed to i guess have you know to say i do and i you know i, I like this and i also dislike yes. this and i think there is kind of an assumption that we have to like everything and that we have to you know you still have to care for an object even if you don't like it and so True. you kind of can't really pick and choose in that way you have to kind of have the same amount of care to everything but obviously the general public have very differing opinions on what is you know i think particularly with art this whole idea of good art and bad art and oh my my six-year-old could have done this and i don't know i think there's a lot of conversations that you can have surrounding that that actually there's a lot more to it than just oh you know it's fat on a chair i think there's you know yes yeah no i agree i agree and i think that that would be a good conversation to have um that is a a topic which i wouldn't say i have made a firm opinion of so for me that would be a good one to yeah to hear sort of sides of you know? yeah i mean that's the thing uh, my opinion changes as well so you know yes, it's yeah. it, it's not like oh i like all i mean as i said you know there's a lot of modern art that i equally go in and i'm like what on earth is this? Like, what have we come yeah. to see? It's not fat on a chair. That's what, I mean, that's, that's that's what that we know. Was, that really was um, comedy <laughs> gold. Uh. <laughs> well, I was going to ask you, um, talking about sort of picking and choosing our favourites, do you have a favourite one in the sort of remit of the curated areas? Oh, that's really difficult. Can I pick one from each museum? Is that allowed? Yeah, you're allowed. Yeah, I mean, I'm allowed. I mean, usually, usually we don't allow that on this podcast. Okay, sorry. Um, uh, <laughs> no, no, of course. Um, of course, whatever you feel. Okay, well, I mean, there's so many lovely objects and there's kind of things that I really... Like. Okay, for the castle, I'm going to say... So there's... Mainly because she has a really interesting history. It's the bust of Sappho. Um, so she... Uh -huh. Sappho, yeah. So she is, well, she was a poet and she is often a symbol or associated with lesbianism. So she's a, oh. she's a, yeah, she's a really kind of wonderful kind of character. And actually she is often um, kind of underplayed, I think, in sort of the, in like, I guess like Greek history and stuff. But effectively, oh, so she's from, she's from like old Greek times. Yes. Yeah. Very ye oldy Greek times, as it were. Um, <laughs> in the Great Hall, it's full of paintings of previous college masters, of kind of like religious dignitaries. Um, there's apostle paintings. There's a few landscapes. They're all, I mean, you know, the big thing here is they're all dead white men. Yeah. And there are no women in the hall at all, apart from the bust of Sappho. Um, mm. So she's like, 
from that perspective, she's the only female presence in a room that's dominated by men. That's one of the problems with the college. So the college itself only admitted women from 1987. So Oh, it's like a conscious choice? Yeah, or? so up until that point, only men could study at the college, um, which... Right. The ha- there were so one of the other colleges at the university, St Mary's, for a long time that was a women only college, but obviously this kind of notion of I guess you know men in academia and I guess you know continuing the ideas of like the patriarchy and stuff that's something yeah. that was very much kind of part of life at university college uh, you know being the oldest college university and you know, it's in a castle it kind of it perpetuated those kind of ideas mm-hmm. the fact that somebody like that you know not only is she kind of a symbol of lesbianism she's a powerful kind of you know female poet you know i'd say she's regarded quite highly you know for her work but was often overshadowed by other kind of male greek poets you know as is usually the way but she you know she stands on a windowsill in a room that's full of men and i don't th- i don't think you'd know that if you didn't know she she had reconstruction she sh- should be reconstructed um i don't think you know um and that's yeah. the kind of beauty of conservation is that if it's done properly you shouldn't even be able to tell that work has been done on something so oh yeah um, man i've seen i've seen some awful you've seen that one wasn't oh, it the, the you know which one Jesus. i mean yeah that's it yeah <laughs> I love, I love that. It's so ridiculous. I mean, why why that even happened? I mean, it just... Oh, I, how does, I how it does that happen? Reasons. Is it just given to, like, amateurs? Is that why? I mean, that's the thing. Like, it... Bless. I think, because it wasn't it some, like, really old Spanish woman, and basically yeah. she thought she was... You know, she thought she was doing the right thing, and she was... Yes. You know, she meant no harm by it, but she absolutely, like ruined that painting for those for those who are watching this on <laughs> youtube by the way if it, I'll, I'll put a picture up if you're listening to it on spotify what was the name of it do you know i don't, i just call it spanish jesus i don't i just, Span- just search, search for spanish jesus i mean he'll come I, I, up he will it, it will come up it's, it's it does kind of look like a monkey like it doesn't like a monkey there's no doubt he looks like a monkey it doesn't look like a person it looks like a monkey like it's yeah, yeah, i it mean it's an old lady her. who too took uh fate into her own hands for our, our boy spanish jesus yeah the thing is other people have done it since and they've like there's been other similar ones particularly around europe of people doing you know particularly like you know older women kind of just you know they're often quite integrated within their kind of like church community and they just take it upon themselves to just oh. fix these. They're often not necessarily priceless paintings, but what they end up doing to them is often far removed from yeah. what it ever began as. But it's, I mean, it's just, all it's done just, in... Just is slightly over their head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, that's the thing is none of this is ever... I think that's what's interesting about that is that nev- none of that is ever done like maliciously. No. They genuinely think they're doing the right thing. And so I think that's what's... You know, important to remember with all of that is that they're doing it with the That's best nice. will in the world. They're just doing an awful job of it, and they're not qualified. <laughs> yes, no, I think um, I think you're right, and that's a nice way of looking at it too. Of course, they sh- it it's not a good thing for them to be doing, but then again, there's only a certain amount that you can give them flack for it. You know, exactly. Yeah, where I their mean, heart like, was. I feel like he's become a lot more. You know he's got kind of worldwide fame now as a result of it so you know no one would have known about him otherwise so it's uh, i'm trying to think of the positives (laughs) well due to time i am gonna have to to wrap this up soon and and there is one question which i have been wanting to ask and it's a little bit more in the uh, in the field of museums than than curation and Mm -hmm. is there a certain type of crowd that you see come into the museums that you're dealing with but also nowadays we try and put a lot of interactive element into museums Mm -hmm. and in, in my mind that seems like a good thing it seems to attract people to to museums but i've also heard the argument that a uh, potential that would dumbing people down or that the right, yeah. uh, attention span of people nowadays are a lot shorter because they're on the phone so we're having to like dress up museums more yeah yeah what's your opinion on that on that take yeah so i mean because we're kind of a museum of the university um there is an expectation so like for example all of our displays in like, the museum of archaeology um we don't dumb down the description of things that you know the there i think i remember reading somewhere once that often the average reading age um in some museums is about like five to six years old which to me seems ridiculously young um <laughs> however we we tend to have it more like the reading age of somebody who's probably you know like end of year six kind of like starting year seven yes. so more kind of like 10 11 that sort of age and because i think you know what's important is the fact that you actually get across the both like the history of an object but also the stories associated with it and i don't think you can always do that if it's Mm -hmm. simplified to the point where you're having to kind of dumb down everything because sometimes there isn't a substitute word for something and you know sometimes that's a really important 
part of it. Um, and I think because of that, we do get such a wide variety of, you know, when we're actually open and people can come in, um, we there is a variety of people who, you know, you, you have everything from kind of, you know, families with young children to kind of older people who've just come for the day to people who are doing research to students um people who are on holiday we often get a lot of tourists coming and you know yeah. they range from you get a lot of kind of people from across the uk we get a lot of people from abroad a lot of international well, it's quite uplifting to see uh, such a range of people yeah it's really nice actually and i couldn't really say oh there's one particular kind of demographic that we get and i think that's what's really nice about it i mean i guess the flip side is the difficulty in trying to make sure that there's something for everyone um mm-hmm. and i think that can be difficult when you're dealing with a collection that is so varied, but also needs enough kind of description so that you can understand it, particularly the archaeology, because sometimes you can look at it and you're like, this is just a piece of pot. But you need to be able to tell the stories as to why it's important, you know. Yes, because, I understand. And that's the thing. I mean, it's funny because my boss and I, we joke about the fact that, as I said earlier, you know, archaeology isn't really something that I, I've kind of had to be forced into it. Uh, I didn't mm-hmm. come to it willingly. And I still am not a massive fan of pottery. I like pottery when it's all in its finished form and it's like a beautiful pot. Yes. But little shirt, that you know, we, we, we call them sherds. Um little sherds of pottery i'm definitely still not what's a shirt yeah before. i mean initially i thought it was a typo when i read it in our um like cataloging i was like why do you keep saying shirt and not shard but no it's yeah. called a shirt so that's like a little piece of pottery and that's usually the kind of stuff you're going to find if you do an excavation um, right. but you need to tell people you know why that's important so you know we have a lot of ones that are they were made locally and so they're an important piece of local history the fact that we know that people were making this particular kind of pottery in the 16th century or it kind of shows that we had that the romans kind of spent some time in durham because we have kind of mortarium sherds and they are part of a larger kind of roman pottery vessel and stuff so those kind of things i think you know you need to explain why it's important not just oh it's just a piece of pot and i think that can sometimes be hard with loads of different kind of audiences but i like to think that we we do a pretty good job i mean recently I say recently at this point it's probably like well over six months ago but I feel like the the Covid times have kind of blurred my perception of time of course yeah for everybody I don't yeah. know when, when it was last month or six months ago yeah and I did like a little trail around the gallery of I've hidden eight little Roman um, sailors around the gallery. Oh. And so that was kind of like, well, I say it was initially for children, but actually I, I tried to hide them to the point where, you know, adults would also kind of enjoy looking for them as well. That's so really nice. We do have like a little trail and stuff like that to do. So trying to get something for everybody. But yeah, in terms of making things interactive, it's a really difficult one because I think everything at the moment is moving entirely like digitally because... Obviously, mm-hmm. people off, you know, at the moment, our museums are closed until at least January next year. So nobody can access our collections in person. So the only thing people can use to, to kind of have any context to them um, and feel like they're kind of part of it is digitally. And that's not inherently a bad thing, but it's something that I think you have to be careful about not making everything digital because there is also you know digital poverty is a massive issue and the fact that you know not everybody has access to um, the internet Mm -hmm. or has a smartphone or has the ability to actually access all of these resources online so i think shifting entirely to online is not necessarily a good thing but i think making more resources available online particularly for people who you know live abroad who can't come and visit the museum are a good thing but i think having somewhere in between the two where if you have an exhibition in person that exhibition also goes online i think it's a good thing rather than it just being one or the other i see so it's not seeing it as the digital uh, medium as like a as a substitute but more like an add-on yeah and something that i think they need to kind of work together Together and be a lot more I guess symbiotic like have a relationship that works off each other because I think some museums who have you know the time the resources the staff have somebody who's dedicated to doing kind of things digitally you know for context there's there's me and there's my boss and we basically do two museums so wow. you know we have that to do everything and so because of that you know we don't have the time to digitize everything and you know I have my finger in many many pies and I mean, I love that because it means that every day is different and I have a lot mm-hmm. of variety and I feel like it's sort of uh, the whole, you know, jack of all trades, you know, master of none. But actually I feel as though it's it's not that. I feel like I am becoming a master at lots of different things and Brilliant. 
that's you know that's that can't be a bad thing because you know moving forward i'd like to think that i can kind of turn my hand to most most museumy things yeah you know in the future yeah it's a difficult one i mean you, you've asked me all the hard questions and i feel like i've rambled a lot you, well uh, no you ha- you've you've answered them very well and, and to the point where like i said i'm someone who knows practically nothing about this kind of i go to the museum every now and then when i'm on holiday i went to a couple in berlin but i don't really know anything and it's great to hear someone who's so passionate about it talking about it in such a way that i think our audience is really going to connect with and a lot of people so. are going to hear yeah. this and go hey that's something that i never really i never really considered the role of a curator uh, no i never really considered this opinion on on how uh, modern art is or anything no, like no, that I mean, you that's know? thing i definitely didn't when i was at school and even at sixth form i mean even when I went to university, I definitely didn't set out to be like, this is definitely what I want to do. If I knew I had to kind of pursue a museum qualification in order to actually have those kind of credentials yeah. to move forward. And, and would that be the advice for other people as well who might be listening to this and go, well, hey, that would actually be something which I would really want to be into. Yeah. And- it's one of those where I think it's definitely some places are moving away from making it kind of a requirement and I think that's really good because not everybody mm. has access to you know you know masters are expensive I mean you know I got a scholarship for mine so I didn't have to pay for it but I already have mm-hmm. like undergraduate debt yay um you yay. know and so do a lot of you know most people so it's something that I think you've got to kind of consider and you know museums are as you know I know people probably don't want to hear this but museums you know you're never going to be the best paid in a museum um Mm -hmm. you know I think people do the job because they love what they do and they want to look after kind of history for people now but also for the future and I think you know your priorities are definitely different you know mine was I knew I was never going to be earning millions of pounds working in a museum but I know that what I do is valuable and it's kind of giving back to you know I'd like to think that in 50 100 years time kind of the objects i'm caring for now are still around to kind of tell the oh, stories it's, that, it's, a, it's you know, a literally priceless shop yeah and it's i mean it's really rewarding as well and it's something that i think if you if you love history in, in any way you know you don't have to have necessarily studied it you know if you if you love kind of the past in kind of all its guises and the way that stories can be told through objects and paintings and tapestries and archaeology you know if that really interests you then I think considering a career in a museum is something that I feel like you're gonna you're gonna get a lot out of it maybe not money but you're gonna get a lot of kind of <laughs> a lot of other things <laughs> a lot of other things mine's just one kind of job with you know I really enjoy the objects and the stories and that kind of creating them in a way that people can understand but there's so many different jobs you can have in a museum you know some people really focus on education so they work with the learning team some people really like people you know they inter- interacting with people so they sometimes do they often you know be tour guides or they yeah. are like explainers or they work on the front desk or they do conservation you know there's so many different yeah. jobs in a museum mine is just one of them but for me it kind of encapsulated all the things i loved about history history of art english all the things i really loved doing at school it kind of married them all together in kind of for me, what was kind of like the perfect job, so. Well, that is that is really nice to hear, and I'm glad that it's it's working out for you at the moment. So far, and I'm really hoping yeah. things are going to go strong <laughs> in the future. And again, it'd be great to have you on again to talk about uh, a bit more about art. You know, we've talked yeah, about that I'd museum to, and curation. Because yeah. that really was my kind of first love, and that's kind of what I, I guess, started. That kind of, kind of started the ball rolling in terms of... Yeah. My, you know, kind of starting to research art in a way that was a lot more... You know, it was more than just oh let's look at pop art it was actually understanding the movement what it was about what actually are the social implications of it all that kind of stuff and i think sometimes people give history art a bit of a bad rap and sort of again think that you just kind of go around and you look at pretty art on a wall but it's so much <laughs> more than that and actually there's a lot yeah. historically you can learn from it and i think that's that's one of the things that yeah started this journey i guess well that's a that's a very strong to be continued then which is very <laughs> yeah, nice i'll put it that way yeah Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, very lastly, I want to know, Laura, can people find you anywhere or can people find what you do anywhere? Is there anywhere yes. we, we can learn more about you? Yeah. So so I have various social media platforms. Um, so I'm on Instagram. I'm down as Vintage Little Fairy on very, Instagram. It's, it's very accurate. Yeah. The, yeah I'm, thank you. I mean, I'm, I love vintage. That's also another thing. If you, if you choose to follow me. You'll know that something. instantly if you follow you. Yeah. I mean, that's I'm all about like old things. So um, you'll definitely see that. I mean, people, I think I assume it's because I really like, I mean, fairies are great, but it's because my last name's Little Fair. And so Little Fairy mm. kind of became 
became like a bit of a nickname that I guess I've had at points and um, so like vintage it just kind I of never never came made on. that connection yeah people don't and I'm like it's because it's my name it's literally <laughs> it's a good pun and so, people aren't noticing yeah so I'm so that's me on Instagram I also recently had a foray into Twitter I'm Laura Littlefair on that but my what do they call it Your or handle? your handle that's it I mean to oh, me yeah. a handle's on a bike but anyway like handlebars but um no no we're, we're down with the kids here it's, uh, I'm, not it's down with the, yeah. I'm not down with the kids then um <laughs> <laughs> i'm anything but but um i'm on there is my handle is vintage lil fairy because little was too many characters i couldn't oh uh, so that. you're like lil like lil, lil john or like, lil wayne exactly because i'm down with the kids um and i also manage the social media accounts for both durham castle museum which is Durham Castle Museum Mm -hmm. and the Museum of Archaeology. The one that's probably most me is Instagram. It kind of shows my crazy, vintage, colourful, museum-y life. Every time I see a picture, even if I'm just scrolling, it takes only a quarter (laughs) of a second for me to go, oh my God, that's Laura. And I'm like instantly like, I I need to like that one. Because I kind of feel like I've created some sort of weird, like unintentionally, like my own kind of little brand, I guess. It's beautiful. I like it. You know, and I'm all about kind of colour and kind of, I mean, I, I guess it's very. It seems very cliche, sort of saying like happiness and joy. But the point is, I was like, about to say it's a happy place. You know, people do say like it's it's really joyful, and the fact that they kind of they're like so many people, rich, particularly as we get into the kind of colder seasons. You know, things. You know, people are like, oh, you know, everyone starts to dress in like black and grey and yeah. blue, you know, like dark colours. And I'm here like oranges, yellows, reds. You know, I and just I'm, like, say I'm, like, like I, I know autumn's gonna be good because I'll see some Laura posts in orange. Correct, you will. <laughs> like, orange is my favourite colour, so. Uh, you'll definitely be seeing a lot of that. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thank you, Laura, for being on on no, the podcast. It's been absolutely me. amazing having you. Yeah, no problem. I think we've learned we've learned a lot today. I've had a lot of fun. <laughs> Super. Thanks, Ben.